All right. Well, welcome to Thus Spoke Zarathustra Act Two. This is a part of a larger series I'm doing introducing the book Thus Spoke Zarathustra through its four parts. Uh, in the first video, I covered, of course, Act One, which was titled Introducing the Overman, which gave you a sense of basically Nietzsche's fundamental concepts uh, that he um, starts to describe in the in the prologue in the first act, uh, what he titles uh, Zarathustra's speeches. Um, and I'm titling act two, uh, Introducing the Society. Now, all of these summaries of uh, each of the acts, they do mirror uh, the acts in the book itself, but uh, I'm, I'm myself labeling each of the acts. Uh, Nietzsche himself does not label the acts. For example, act one, in thus book Zarathustra is not titled Introducing the Overman, and Act Two is not titled Introducing the Society. However, in my reading of these uh, acts and an attempt to structure them and to present them in a in a new way, um, I do feel like um, I was able to come up with with names for the acts which um, are faithful representations to the overall message that Nietzsche is trying to communicate through uh, each of the sections. So with that being said, um, and before starting, <laughs> I, I want to let you guys know that uh, I'll be um, starting a course on the Spoke Zarathustra, which will go into far greater detail um, uh, in go into the nooks and crannies of the book Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, and also to uh, open up large discussion spaces about um, all of the different subsections of the book and some of the nuances of the text and, and, and basically trying to harvest and find all of the gold in this book. Uh, there's so much gold in every section. There's so much gold in every story uh, and in every character. Um, and also that the course will be a collective container and also mirroring the course I just completed with uh, Phenomenology of Spirit will be a creative container. Um, we'll be attempting also to work towards a conference at the end of the course uh, and produce hopefully a edited book uh, that has a unique style and a unique flavor because it will be a conference and a book that is the outcome of all of the students in the course uh, and um, only made possible by the collective feedback and the collective dynamic and the collective discussion of the people in the course. So if you're interested in joining that, go to uh, www.philosophyportal.online. Uh, go to the, check out the course outline, check out the overview of Thus Spoke Zarathustra and uh, starts July 15th and would be fantastic to have you along for this second philosophy portal initiative. And this here are the, the presents the main concepts I'm trying to communicate here from the, the, the second act. Uh, and this is also a good sort of simple um, introduction to Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is good preparation for the course itself. It will you know, sort of give you a head start or a jump start on the on the course itself. Um, some of the main concepts here that may jump off the screen as unique to Nietzsche's philosophy, of course, number 11, we have the will to power. Um, that's a central concept in, in Nietzsche's work. Um, some of the other concepts you might sort of be reminded of from your research and work in philosophy in general, concepts like the rabble, um, the importance of dreams and wisdom, uh, time and loss. Um, but the overall here thematic that, that Nietzsche is trying to present through Act Two of Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra is almost the overman's perspective on society. And what I want to say is the overman's perspective specifically in Nietzsche's context uh, of Christian society. Now, of course, today we live in a less Christian, let's say, a more secular society than the one Nietzsche was growing up in. Uh, Nietzsche was growing up in a 19th century European German Germanic society. Um, and 
the 20th century and the 21st century have become progressively, let's say, more secular, especially in European context. But I still think that his, his main message and the main concepts he's using to speak to this society have uh, a great deal of relevance for us today. So first, dream wisdom. Um, the second act starts off, uh, again, as is thematic throughout the book. Each act starts with Zarathustra in a deep aloneness. Um, this is a meta structural point for Nietzsche in the book is this oscillation between his aloneness and his capacity to exist in the human world, um, given the imperfection of uh, other human beings um, and just the nature of the world itself. It's, it's almost as if this building up of a pregnancy in aloneness is the sort of method by which Zarathustra endures and, and, and overcomes uh, the imperfection of the human world. In any case, there's this act, uh, this, this section uh, starting off the book where he is alone in his cave and he is in a deep sort of meditation um, and, a, a, and a vision comes to him in, in, in a dream. And this vision in the dream is a child coming up to him with a mirror and he sees a reflection in the mirror of a satanic or a devil-like figure. And it's not 100% clear if this satanic devil figure is reflecting something about Zarathustra's own motivational system. There's sort of um, a, a vibe, I would say, or a, 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 an implicit communication that this is what's uh, going on, that, that Zarathustra is getting some um, insight into his uh, underlying motivational system. And, and we can say that if you do confront yourself in aloneness, you can be faced with visions and images of your more violent and your more darker motivational substructures. Um, in any case, um, the main metaphor that runs throughout this, um, this, this passage is the idea that you have to, uh, again, almost go into pregnancy and then, and, and, and then have this, this fullness of heart, um, which then allows you to then give birth. Um, and, and, and throughout, uh, thus spoke Zarathustra, he uses these metaphors of birth, um, of, of, of pregnancy, of children, um, and of course, in the context of Zarathustra's quest, his children are not literal children in terms of he's actually giving birth, but children in the sense of um, trying to find the ways to try to develop the methods by which he can bring the overman into existence and, and encourage other people to, um, in a sense, follow in his direction, which of course, does not mean a direct mimicry, um, but a sort of an awareness of the general principles and ethics by which the overman overcomes um, the human world. So the next main concept is time and loss, which you could say is a, a, a predisposition. Uh, you have to have a certain relationship to time and loss in order to embody the ethical principles of the overman and he juxtaposes time and loss to the ideas of eternal perfection or god um, it's clear that the type of god that that nietzsche's trying to combat or negate is the god of eternal perfection and consequently if you think about the opposite of eternal perfection well we have the affirmation of time and we have the affirmation of loss um, that Nietzsche sees the psychological relationship to these two dimensions of, say, natural existence as necessary for overman creation and willing, that you can never really understand what creativity is and you can never really understand what willing is if you cannot affirm the existence of time and the necessity of loss. 
Um, so there's some really beautiful passages um, in this section where he talks about the number of times he has had to lose, the number of times he has had to part ways with people that he has deeply loved or projects that he has deeply loved. Um, and he's basically saying that this is, is a necessary emotional reality that uh, if you are on the pathway of the overman is fundamental, is central. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, on the other hand, if you have this image or if you have this vision of an eternal perfection, and then that's your main thing that you're interacting with, then it, it kind of does close off any possibilities of, of genuine creativity, genuine novelty, the, the emergence of the new, um, and also a space for your will, uh, which, you know, if you do make space for your will, um, is quite, it's introducing a quite unstable, chaotic element into the, uh, in, into the otherwise sort of fixed reality that is sort of stabilized by the eternal perfection. So because your will is, is not an, an, an eternal perfection, at least not functioning in the way that the traditional conception of God functions. And then he comes more and more out of his, as is also a sort of meta structure for the each of the acts. He starts off in a more of a solitude and he comes more and more into the human world and um, first articulate sort of what he feels or what he sees in the quote unquote human animal. Um, to use a term that is also very popular in the works of philosophers like Alain Badiou uh, or also uh, Slavoj Žižek, the idea that the human animal for, for Nietzsche is, uh, an, a, is basically defined as an animal of shame. Um, and this is something that runs throughout Das Buch Zarathustra. Uh, it's a fundamental idea. Um, one that really does get unpacked in deeper ways in the in the fourth act, I would say. Um, but that this is how Nietzsche approaches the difference between himself and the humans that he's attempting to encourage to go on to this path of, of the overman, is that the human without knowing, and so we make a distinction here between knowing and knowledge, it's like the human without knowing is 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 a human that is just drenched in its own shame. It's covered in its own shame. It doesn't know itself. It's not capable or not willing to to know itself. Um, and that he describes the the man, the overman, the, the the person on the path to knowing, or the person who is let's say in possession of of a certain type of deep knowing about the self. Um, is is beyond shame and and he uses the example of he he walks among humans in the same way that he would walk among animals um that that he because he's beyond shame um the humans who are covered in shame view him in a different way um because they're viewing him through their own shame and so he appears different um, to the human world precisely for this, uh, this, because of this simple distinction. And the main way by which I think he tries to encourage one to get over shame is um, to replace what he calls a more mechanical virtue with a more organic virtue and tries to encourage the human being to connect to a more organic virtue. What, what, what basically is implied here is that the human animal is precisely shamed by the fact that it is an animal. Um, and the human animal is feeling shame because it's, it's born, because it's messy, because they, you know, because of the joy of the body, they feel shame. Um, just simply the fact that we're, we're, we are from the organic world is something that he's trying to uh, confront us with on a, on a deep emotional level. And I think that this is, again, how Nietzsche's philosophy ties and fits in so nicely with the evolutionary picture of the world. 
um, but also that he's addressing a psychological and emotional dimension to the birth of the uh, evolutionary world, which I don't think is approached by, let's say, evolutionary biologists or the scientific world in general. Um, and he uses a very interesting example of um, organic virtue by pointing towards the natural relationship between the mother and the child. Um, he sort of emphasizes that, you know, you don't need to ever pay a, 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 a mother to care for, for a child, that, that a man's virtue should also be like this, that you, you should be, be doing whatever you're doing out of the pure love, the pure joy. Um, for for your doing it, and, he, and 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 this is a theme that he repeats over and over again: is that a man's virtue has to be wherever his child is, and so consequently, you know, to use this metaphor, he he introduces a, a distinction related to the child that points towards the idea that the way man's virtue is now, let's say mechanical is too childlike. He, he compares it to like a toy, that the man's virtue is like a toy that he's playing with. And that if you take away the toy, he'll cry like a child's crying. And so the, the, the sort of the virtue needs to be matured to the real of the body and the real of, of life. Um, and, and I like that distinction. And, and it's an important thing to keep in mind for future sort of sections of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, where um, he seems to make the distinction between a man who has remained childlike, um, who has yet to confront maturity. Um, again, referencing the, the last video I did, we can here think about the three metamorphos metamorphoses, pardon me, the three metamorphoses of spirit, um, that of the camel, the lion, and the child, um, and that that there's a big difference between a man who has remained childlike and a man who has matured through the metamorphoses of spirit, that of the camel carrying a heavy load, disciplining yourself, the lion searching out, becoming the master of your desire, uh, and then becoming more childlike. And then this distinction um, is again one that will become um, that much more important uh, in the acts to, to, to come later. Um, and then there's, there's a long meditation on what, what we could call the rabble. The rabble is a concept that Nietzsche uses throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It's also a concept that, that Hegel used. Um, and it is a distinction here from, let's say, a Marxist conception of society where Marx uses terms like the proletariat instead of the rabble. And there's a major distinction here between concepts like rabble and concepts like proletariat, because the proletariat gives you sort of an image of a unified, um, empowered um, working class, um, which sort of knows what they want and are trying to powerfully enact a people's revolution. Whereas the rabble is more of a disorganized crowd of people who are uh, without knowing and kind of common common let's say there's there's the manifestation of a, tr a type of herd mentality or a, a commonplace um, idiocy um, which uh, Nietzsche actually is um, perceiving as a uh, as an unconscious tyranny on the possibilities of the overman. He specifically refers to the rabble as the poison of human life, um, which specifically destroys everything with lust and requires that those of deep inner reflective capacity um, need to withdraw from this rabble in order to basically save their soul. Um, now, some important dimensions here is the fact that he connects this rabble with lust, um, is that in some sense, how we need to view the difference between the rabble or the common man and the overman is the man that's willing to work with his or her lust um, and really transform it, really mature it, as opposed to sort of becoming uh, or remaining a slave um, um, to lust. 
um, and, and, and this higher sensibility of the overman, the capacity not to repress one's lust, one's desire, one's immediate urges, um, but to, to, to mature it, to work with it, to, to cultivate it, um, to, to grow with it, as opposed to just unconsciously acting on it or, or, or um, remaining, again, a slave to it. Um, and I suppose that that here again, what's important is this this need for silent withdrawal, which is caused by sort of the poison of, of being among the rabble is what are you doing with your silent withdrawal? Um, how are you in your alone with your alone um, confronting your own sort of inner reflective images? Making sense of them, making which is the same as making sense of yourself. Um, this is this is very uh, important for Nietzsche and the concept of the overman, and 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 building on that, there's a second dimension of the rabble that um, is fundamental to Nietzsche's philosophy, which is that Nietzsche Nietzsche suggests that that the rabble, as this herd mentality, as this collective mass of stupidity or idiocy. Um, because of their, uh, you know, from Nietzsche's point of view, because they're so low, because they're so unconscious, um, they do not know or they do not, they're not in touch with greatness, um, that they want total equality between humans um, and consequently attack greatness and inequality, where Nietzsche sees greatness as, one, if you're going to affirm the conditions of possibility for greatness, that you are by definition going to have inequality because not everyone is great, which is, which is something that is a theme that runs throughout Nietzsche's work. Not everyone is great. And if you're going to allow people to explore their potentials, some people are going to be greater than others. Um, and, and for Nietzsche to attack this, to attack inequality, you know, you can say there's an intensive dimension that emerges from greatness because there's intensities of, of inequality. Um, and Nietzsche is just affirming this. Nietzsche Nietzsche's saying that uh, we have to just not, not only live with that, that reality, but, but rather enjoy um, that reality. Uh, enjoy the fact that there's greatness. And, 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 if, and if you're not great, to accept that as well, uh, to, to have the courage to confront what you are. Um, so, so even, you know, even if you're, and I guess on, on the other hand is to also find out what is your potentiality for greatness, because you can't be great at everything. Um, and there are some people who are going to have natural skills or who are going to have certain dispositions that you don't have. And so not to be envious and bitter and jealous about their greatness, um, but to find out what really makes you, uh, great. That's, I think his main message here. And I, you know, in, in, uh, the reason I have this here, the, the idea of the famous wise men, I want to connect this idea of the famous wise men in Nietzsche to the rabble, because Nietzsche himself is connecting these ideas. And, and, and I, what I want to articulate is the higher order relationship that Nietzsche sees here between famous wise men, and here I'll put wise men in quotes, and the rabble. Um, because from Nietzsche's point of view, um, the people we see uh, on, t you know, for in our day on the internet, on, on, on television, on the radio, the people who are supported by, let's say, mainstream institutions, um, the presidents, the political authorities, and so forth, that these are puppets of the rabble. Um, and that they sort of uh, th 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 you know, it's, it's an illusion to think of them as actually in charge or them as actually the powerful ones. It's actually that there's this unconscious herd mentality, which is really the source of power. And it's very interesting because it's also a very Hegelian view of the first order of the master-slave relationship, that the master gets its identity from the slave or the famous wise men get their identity from the rabble. Um, but the rabble are really the, the where the power is um, and also that the conditions of possibility for the true master or the true overman are within the lust of the rabble. Um, in any case, what he wants to communicate here with this idea of famous wise men is that 
the rabble uses these men to hunt f- and, and destroy free spirits who has a nice line in the book where he talks about the free spirits who make their nest out of an abyss. And this idea of um, the overman or the free spirit making their men out of an abyss is, is kind of like he's breaking the dialectic between the rabble and the famous men um, and saying that in order not to be a slave of the rabble and in order to not be a sort of an unconscious part of herd mentality of the rabble is that you have to be in touch with the abyss. You have to make sacrifices, which are extremely difficult. Um, and you have to be aware that the people among the rabble and the famous wise men will try to hunt you and will try to make your life even more difficult. Um, so this is, again, one of the hurdles and one of the larger points that Nietzsche is trying to make which is important uh, for the overman's view of the society at large and the dynamics that one has to. And again, this is, this is an interesting way to work through the master slave dynamic um, and, and to, you know, and he's, he's, he's working through this in a very similar way to the way Hegel works through it in the phenomenology of spirit, which is that there's a certain confrontation with an inner abyss or in Hegel's words, an inner confrontation with death which needs to be done in order to really become free uh, in the spiritual sense. And that's a nice segue into the the idea of the priest, which is connected to the idea of the famous wise men. And what Nietzsche is here concerned with telling us is to identify what he sees as the underlying motivational structure of the priest, that the priest is a disguised form of revenge Uh, for personal suffering, that the priest is someone who has suffered a lot. He's bitter. He is, you know, deep down, he is, um, let's say, upset with the body, upset with the realities of life, upset with sort of thwarted or failed desire. Um, And that the church is a sort of um, structural mechanism by which one gets protection from the horribleness of the world. Um, But from Nietzsche's point of view, that this protection is made out of false values. In fact, in the book, he gives um, very colorful and and flowery imagery of um, the church as this island oasis in a turbulent sea. But in fact, it's this island oasis in the middle of the turbulent sea is, is a monster which will consume the people that um, think they're getting protection from this very same island. So so it's an interesting way to think about it. It's interesting, you know, this idea that the world is so difficult that you need to go to this protective island called the church um, and and wear all of these disguises of the robes, um, but that ultimately you're going to be eaten from within by this by this very reclusive and this very sort of sheltered uh, mode of existence, which he calls the the false values. Um, And then there's a really interesting passage um, related to this concept called the Firehound, where actually Zarathustra's character uh, literally is on an island and he is going to see a a volcano, a a flaming volcano to go to the heart of this this volcano. Um, And all of that is done as, again, a metaphor um, for this idea that the church and the state, what we just, what we just discussed with the famous wise men and the priest, that they speak and act as if they are the depth of being itself or the most fundamental reality, the most fundamental truth. Um, But that they only appear that way to the rabble um, who have not confronted the depths of their own inner being or who have not confronted the depths of their own, their own self. Um, And so uh, in the book, Nietzsche takes us through this idea that when you confront the inner thing, uh, which is making so much noise, um, you see that it's, it's, it's fake. You see that it's fraudulent. He's trying to get you to this idea that if you go to the heart or if you go to the core of the, volcano making a lot of noise which is a metaphor for the church and the state 
that you see that they're actually impotent and they actually are not connected to the depths of being itself. Um, and that in confronting that, you're you're again confronted with the fact that I have to confront the depths of, of my being. Um, and there's a, allusions to the idea that by confronting the depths of your own inner being, of course, you're going on the path of the overman um, and that you're actually speaking uh, potentially from the real depths of being. I um, mean, that is a very empowering notion because it, it, it's the idea that if you do really confront yourself and you really do go on that self-search, that, that you are someone who is connected to the depths of being. You don't need to um, find it outside of you, so to speak, in the church or the state. Uh, in the so in the in the society out there, which are prevent which are which are presenting that that illusion, um, and and that's 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 fundamentally connected to another relationship, which is I, I want to say it's it's related to the the overman on the, the the person on the path of the overman and the rabble, but it might be more articulate to say that it it's sort of the relationship between the person who has really gone a long distance on his way to the overman and people who are not quite ready yet to, to go on that search, which is the distinction between what he calls dark and light souls. Now the dark souls here has a negative connotation. Uh, the dark souls he claims feed on the light souls. Um, and he gives the metaphor of breasts which is a, actually a common metaphor that Nietzsche uses throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the idea, and, and it's connected to immaturity, connected to infancy, of you know, sucking on the, mother, on the mother's breast. And the, the dark souls suck on the light souls like a child would suck on the mother's breast. And it, it's, again, gives this idea of a developmental immat immaturity. Whereas the light souls only have their own abyss or their own darkness to feed on. So that's, again, connected to the idea that the free spirits have to make their nest out of an abyss. Um, and throughout the passage here, Nietzsche is sort of lamenting in some ways the aloneness, is lamenting how difficult it is to be a light soul, that to, 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 to only have your own light. Um, and, and at the same time that this is the best possible direction we can take. Um, but but it, you know, he gives he actually gives cosmic metaphors here, metaphors of sort of a, a, a shining star in the middle of a vast darkness. Um, if you think about the nature of the universe, it's he's 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 here reflecting um, just the way the universe is that the shining stars of our universe are surrounded by abysses. Uh, they have no capacity to feed on 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 other stars for their power. Uh, they're 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 fully self sufficient in some sense. And this brings us to one of the most important and and famous concepts in Nietzsche's work: the idea of the will to power. Now, the will to power, um, Nietzsche first articulates in a dialectic, which is again very similar to Hegel's master-slave dialectic. It's a dialectic of obeying and commanding. Um, that what's interesting is that, and, and what I think is important, and again, it's sort of a paradox that Hegel also articulates, is that yes, the commander is embodying a certain will to power, but he also says that the person who obeys is following the logic of a will to power, um, although in a more sneaky and secretive way going about that, that same drive. Um, but ultimately he sees the will to power as one thing, which gets bifurcated into a dialectic of, of a relationship between two. And he, he suggests that what the will to power is in itself is a desire for constant self-overcoming. And so if this desire for constant self-overcoming is unconscious and unreflective, then the relationship between obeying and commanding will be externalized. So you'll obey something external to you or you'll command something external to you. But there's this idea that someone who has really deepened his spiritual self-search in the will to power will realize that this obeying and commanding is, is again, occurring within one's own self. Um, and that, that, that it's, it's difficult to command great things of yourself, but that it's even more difficult, Nietzsche suggests, 
to obey those great commands within your own self. Um, I think this is a very important uh, dimension of Nietzsche's philosophy. And I think uh, a misread dimension of Nietzsche's philosophy, misrepresented dimension of Nietzsche's philosophy, you know, when he says everything is power, there's no, you know, I've heard people say Nietzsche thinks everything is power and there's no truth. This is obviously not true. Uh, that's obviously not a correct interpretation of, of what Nietzsche is trying to say. What Nietzsche is trying to say is that the truth is a desire for constant self-overcoming. And that's, I think, the, the correct interpretation of, of Nietzsche's message. Now, connected to that is a really beautiful passage about the idea that in order to go to the depths of your being, in order to really connect to your wealth of power, that you have to confront inner monsters. Um, and that these monsters should be interpreted as self riddles. So he has some great lines where he talks about how, you know, scholars or, or, or many professionals who are successful, successful men, they will have confronted external monsters. They will have confronted external riddles, but they will have not confronted the inner monster as a riddle, uh, which he claims holds the key to real beauty. Um, and there's this idea that there's in this process of confronting the monsters and, and, and knowing real beauty that one sort of lightens and lets go, that one becomes much lighter and one, one lets go of a certain tyrannical dimension of the psyche, uh, which may be an externalization of the monster. Um, and I think there's also some nice reflections here about how the intellectual men and um, the successful men are really, they struggle the most with beauty, that they really struggle um, with the reality of beauty and, and, and maybe the, the, the dimension, of, they're uncomfortable with how beauty actually operates inside their own psyche and their, their desire and their demand for beauty. Um, which I think is really worth thinking about. And also the connection with to really know beauty, you actually have to know something actually quite violent and dangerous, you know, the idea of a monster. Um, I think that's, that's also crucial uh, to understanding this, this dynamic within oneself. And I think that, that that's also fundamentally connected to, let's say, the distinction that Nietzsche makes between what he calls pure perception and immaculate perception. So pure perception is, is, is for Nietzsche not good. Um, pure perception is what we call a height without depth. Uh, in the book, he gives an example of like this gaze at the earth as if from the moon, um, which is a really interesting idea when you think about Nietzsche writing this in the 19th century. Of course, humans had never been to the moon in the 19th century, but nonetheless, he gives this, you know, this, this, this image of a pure perception being a type of gaze at the earth from the moon with no real connection to the earth. Um, it's a metaphor for not really being connected to life and just having this, you know, holy, pious view of, of the earth as if you're not really there, as if you're not really involved in the thing. Whereas immaculate perception is a height with depths. So it's almost as if you, well, it, you know, it's specifically that you have gone through your own mess. You have gone through your own body, that you are viewing the world not from without, but from within, from within your own pathological universe. But a pathological universe, again, that has been cultivated, that has been matured to an immaculate perception, as opposed to, for example, the lustful view of the rabble is, is, is I guess, the uh, best way to distinguish it. And I think that, that here with pure and immaculate perception, I don't think Nietzsche would say that the rabble have a pure perception. I think what he would say is the, the sort of the, the, the priestly or the scholarly class have a type of pure perception that is a perception as if they're not in the world. Whereas, and this will be relevant to future uh, passages we're going to be going through here in this act too, that, that, that someone with an immaculate perception has kind of worked through um, both the cultivating his perception away from the lust of the rabble 
um, but also has avoided the temptation of this view from without uh, as, as someone who has not really gone through sort of the, the, the depths of their own being. Um, and, and, and in order to go into the depths of, of one's own being, Nietzsche uses this idea of the graveyard of memories. And if the graveyard of memories is actually the, the memories from childhood. And, and this, is, this is important if we connect this to the, the lust of the rabble, because Nietzsche's main claim about the way we should deal with lust or desire is that we need to um, make ourselves more innocent as it relates to our desire and our lust, that we need to see the childlike innocence in these desires in order to prevent them from becoming monstrous um, or to prevent them from becoming sort of barbaric and, and rabble-like. Um, and he, he goes on uh, a, quite a long um, reflection on how the visions from our youth are like godlike moments of, 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 of eternity, like there's no time in, in childhood. Um, that there's a type of eternity in childhood which gets stolen from us or robbed from us. There's also this idea that that society uh, that, that conditions us in such a way as that it installs mechanical social virtues into us, which destroy our our childlike innocence. There's certainly this this relationship which is which is which is set up, and 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 one wonders how how insofar as how a society could be built to avoid this process, let's say, of, of installing mechanical social virtues in children to destroy their sort of childlike innocence. Is, is that dialectic something that we have to go through and potentially overcome? Or is that something where we could actually design a society that is inherently more organic um, and allows one to constantly be in touch throughout one's entire existence with the godlike moments of our of our of our youth, um, you know, and 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 Nietzsche specifically uses this type of language, godlike moments, and and I think it's connected to another theme throughout *Thus Spoke Zarathustra*: is that there's no there's no one god, but there is the conditions of possibility for godliness. Is something that he he frequently frequently says that there's conditions of possibility for godliness within each of us. Um, and, and that this is also fundamentally connected to the child, which is another meta theme throughout this book, Zarathustra. The child is very fundamental concept in, in Nietzsche's work. Um, and this is becomes more and more explicit um, in this section on education and children, because he, he goes on a long sort of meditation on that education is this search for a fatherland or a motherland uh um and 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 that you know he, he talks about how in this search for a fatherland or a motherland um one finds that that, that you know he or at least zarathustra finds that he he can't find a, a real home uh in any fatherland or a motherland and it means you know i think this is probably him or Nietzsche himself reflecting on the fact that he never really fit in, in in university. He never really found his place in university. Um, and consequently, he points towards this idea that real education comes from a children's land. And he, he even says that one should say, you know, one should apologize for the time he spent uh, in the father's land or the, the, the you know, the, the, you know, the, the idea that you, you know, you shouldn't necessarily just fo blindly follow the world that the father um, instantiated, but rather to search the gold in one's own children's land. Um, now, the idea that one could connect education to this is the idea that that children already sort of teach themselves, so to speak, that children um, in their natural curiosity and their natural exploration to be sort of innocent in their exploration and they're trying to figure out the world this could be in some sense what he's pointing towards um and it, it's certainly a very um and but also that one should treat one's own childhood and the memories from childhood uh to stay to, to stay connected with these images to stay connected with these visions at least the impulses of them um to constantly refresh them is kind of i think what nietzsche is saying is the real education. 
Um, that's obviously connected to, to his view on scholars. Um, and this is also connected to the idea of this distinction between pure and immaculate uh, perception. So in line with that distinction of perception, he says that scholars view their heights as above the organic earth, that they see um, the desires of the masses as lower than them or that the beneath them. And in some sense, Nietzsche agrees with that in the sense that he, he also condemns the lustfulness of the rabble's gaze. Um, but the, again, the distinction is that, that for Nietzsche, as, as you know, going on the path of the overman, is that he's confronted those, 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 those depths. He's confronted that within himself. And, and, and consequently, at the end of this section, he talks about how he is able to desire things that the scholars simply wouldn't, would forbid, that they, that they wouldn't even know about, um, that they would have never possibly been able to explore. So he gets this idea that in exploring your depths and raising them to the heights, that you become much more expansive, that you become a much fuller, richer, and complete um, human being, or even something beyond um, um, human being. And, and throughout this passage, he's, he, he displays quite a lot of contempt towards scholars and, and, and the way they view things. Because again, I think he views scholars as coming from this place of um, pure perception, um, where they view themselves above and outside of the system. So like, I think that that's, that's actually quite relevant for, let's say, contemporary reflections on, on ideas related to systems theory, where you have these ideas of being within the system or outside of the system. Again, also first order and second order cybernetics, you have this distinction from being within the system and being outside the system and, and being inside the system is, is being inside the system, but a disruptive, powerful knower within the system is I think what Nietzsche is pointing towards. Now Nietzsche goes on sort of a long tirade also against poets and, and, but also sort of laments the fact that he himself is, is a poet. Um, and, and even sort of points towards the fact that, you know, don't, don't, don't get too attached to my poetic flowery language. Um, but his, his complaint about poets in general is that they are often um, superficial heights without depths and that they're very lustful. Um, and consequently that their, their, their poetry doesn't have a, have, have a really deep meaning or a deep significance. It hasn't really investigated the core of being. What, what he's looking for is a type of poetry that is really unveiling new dimensions of, of the depths of being itself, uh, not necessarily these superficial heights where he thinks, you know, he says like, you know, poets think they could just go out into nature and view anything or observe anything. And it's all very meaningful and very, very profound. Like they're listening to God wherever they go type of thing. Um, I suppose that that, that, that's, that's, that's something which um, Nietzsche would combat with the idea that, you know, it's only as profound as the depths of the knower who's observing or contemplating the, 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 the phenomena. In any case, he, he warns that the poet uh, runs the danger of becoming, uh, falling into aesthetic life. That is because that they haven't really explored their depths that they'll condemn uh, the depths um, and that they'll become uh, basically uh, a type of person who is, um, basing one's existence on repression and prohibition as opposed to really exploring, let's say, the thing in itself. Now, there's a very much extended passage. I think it's perhaps the longest passage in the second act on the idea of redemption. And if I could summarize this very, I think, cleanly and neatly, it's related to the will to power and it's related to the impotent dimension of the will to power, namely that the will hates that it is impotent to change the past. And there's this idea that the idea that, or even the idea that the will hates what it cannot change. You know, this is actually meditated on with the idea of a, a hunchback, someone with a hunched back. And, you know, the, the idea that you could fall under sort of a very resentful attitude if you constantly focus on the fact that you cannot change what's happened in the past um, and that you have to teach the will. And he, he's very much here pointing towards this idea that we have to educate our own wills. 
Um, and that, that, that's real education. And I guess you would say that in, in university and in, in academic life, you don't really learn how to will. You don't really learn how to create. Um, in any case, that we have to learn, we have to teach our wills to become future oriented, to focus on really what we can change and to bring joy to the self within one's own self. So that this is what he sees as redemption um, and to, to emphasize sort of, you know, the, the power of the will. Um, and I suppose this is, this is also, this is also connected to, um, you know, the, the, the idea that to be a light soul, you have to be in some sense, be self-sufficient. You can't, you know, this idea that you have to bring joy to yourself, that you have to learn how to bring joy to yourself. You have to teach yourself how to do that. Um, is again, this idea that, you know, this dark, the dark soul is something that sucks on the light of someone else. Uh, they're not really capable of a, a, a joy inside their own self. Um, that they're constantly, as it were, sucking on the, the mother's breast, I think is uh, the best, best metaphor. Um, Next, he gives this idea of prudence. And this idea of prudence is he's basically going through these ethics of what he views as the best way for someone on the pathway to Overman to relate to certain dimensions of, um, let's say, imperfection in human social reality that could be particularly difficult in the overcoming of, of the self. Um, the first thing is that and some, some of these things may seem counterintuitive, which is, I suppose, why he's trying to articulate them to the common man. The first one is that he allows deception. The reason he allows deception is because he doesn't want to constantly be worrying about who's deceiving him and who's not deceiving him. In sort of getting rid of this distinction between someone deceiving him and someone who's not deceiving him, he allows deception and, and, and basically has this view that if you do deceive him, that you're doing your own self harm, uh, not me. So that, that, that's, that's one thing that he sees as a prudent virtue or a prudent ethic to have on this path of self overcoming. The next is to see beauty and vanity. And the reason why he sees beauty and vanity is because he says it makes for interesting stories uh, and it makes for a sort of passionate engagement in the world. Um, and so, so don't, don't, don't just don't have a deconstructive or a critical view of vanity, but to see, see the beauty in it, to see, to see the way in which it's producing interesting dramas. And, and, and it's, it's sort of an interesting way for people to explore themselves. Um, and then the final one is to see greatness in evil. Um, and, and, and this is a theme throughout that spoke Zarathustra that, 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 and again, it's connected to Nietzsche's philosophy of beyond good and evil, is because he and my my reading of Thus Book Zarathustra and Nietzsche's work is that he sees evil and good as a as a continuum, as one thing, that they're connected to each other. And then in order for your highest greatness or your highest goodness, you also have to be connected to your your deepest evil. Um, and and I don't think he's necessarily saying that one should unmediated have like this unmediated relationship to one's deepest evil. Although he does say like, you know, even if one is acting on their deepest evil, that that person still has the conditions of possibility for, for greatness and for, for goodness. In any case, there's this idea that if you see greatness in evil, you can sort of more easily withstand some of the darker and the more dangerous aspects of, of, of our life. And, and also sort of, be in touch with like a certain unmediated depths of being, which is important to know about, which is important not to shield yourself from or, or block yourself from. Um, and that these are all reasons on the pathway to the overman. Uh, these are all things that have a certain prudence to them, is his, his message. And I think finally, uh, they, end act, they end act two, uh, Nietzsche ends act two with this, meditation on the stillest silence. And it's actually quite a powerful uh, section um, where uh, he's confronted with a voiceless voice, which challenges him to speak what is most difficult and painful to speak. 
Um, so we again see this meta level oscillation in act two, where he starts off in a, in a, in a deep reclusive state. And now he's coming back to a deeper level of silence. You have this idea that every time he, he, he goes out of silence and then comes back to silence, or every time he comes out of aloneness and goes back to aloneness, that he's reached a deeper level of aloneness. He's reached a deeper level of stillness. Um, and in this level of stillness, in this level of, of aloneness, he is confronted by a voiceless voice. And, it, and, it, and it, it's always unmistakably that it has a feminine quality to it, or it has a, a womanly quality to it. Um, and, and, and at this level, at this level of act two, specifically this, this dimension of, of trying to speak what's most difficult and painful to speak, almost like you've got a, a lump in your throat. You might want to say an Adam's apple. You've got a tension in your throat. And, 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 and what's, what's clear here is that the challenge that the, this voiceless voice is presenting to Nietzsche is that really your capacity to become the overman and your capacity to command great things and to become a great leader, which is a foreshadowing the rest of the book, um, runs through this, this, this dimension. It runs through the dimension of speaking and confronting what's most difficult and what's, mo what's most painful. And I think on, on another note that there's a lot of themes throughout this act too, whether it's been focusing on organic virtue, the virtue of the mother and the child, whether it's been the dark and light souls and the, the dark souls sucking on the light souls like a mother's breast um, and many other dimensions, which are they reflect and foreshadow psychoanalysis. They reflect and foreshadow Freud's psychological understanding. Um, Freud's model of the psyche is bit based on father, mother, child, all these metaphors. And I think that this ends also with a, a psychoanalytic foreshadowing that psychoanalysis itself is also based on this capacity to speak what's most difficult and what's, what's most painful um, inside yourself. That's important. So here we can go an overview of what we just covered in terms of introducing the society. Um, Nietzsche here through Zarathustra is saying that to be in society as, over, as the overman, we must first connect to an overfull dream and vision, which naturally flows um, as love. Um, it, it, it's this dream that starts off act two, which which is again, like act one gives this idea of an overflowing and it gives this idea of a love which is capable of withstanding imperfection. Um, he says that this love which overflows as, as will and creativity and time is capable of enduring any loss and is no longer desiring an eternal God in a, in a beyond. Um, again, for Nietzsche, the beyond is the overman, not, not an eternal God and, and the beyond is not an eternal perfection. Um, but is simply the, let's say, becoming other to oneself, uh, exploring deeper and deeper levels of, of will and creative power. Uh, and that's, again, the will to power is this creative overcoming. So you must walk among human beings who are covered in self-shame about the body-soul. Again, for Nietzsche, the, the soul is the body. And that you must walk among people who are living out mechanical virtues. Um, and he juxtaposes, mechan he juxtaposes mechanical virtues with organic virtues. And he juxtaposes the human animal and the overman with the idea of a, a, a knower who has overcome self-shame about the body. Uh, next into the, the top right quadrant, we have this idea that the rabble are this mass or this herd mind of human life with unconscious dr drives, their desires, their lustful. Um, that they force many into isolation. They force those who are reflective or who have a capacity for the overman into, into isolation. And this is, he sees this as a, ultimately a positive driving force that you, it's how you use your isolation here as it relates to being driven out by the rabble. He says the rabble demand equality for all humans and fight against individual greatness, which produces inequality. So this is the idea that produce inequality rather. This idea that, if we're going to affirm people differentiating from the rabble and becoming and exploring what their, their deepest potentialities are, um, that this greatness in itself will produce inequality. 
and that we have to affirm and, and enjoy this inequality. It says the most famous and powerful men of society are actually slaves to the will of the rabble. So it's again articulating this paradox between master and slave mm -hmm. dialectic. And that both the rabble and the most famous and powerful men will attack what he calls the abyssal free spirits, the, the people on the path of the overmen who are making their nests out of the abyss. Moving down to the, 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 the bottom left quadrant, um, we have this idea that the state and church authorities uh, speak with false values as if they're the depths of being in itself, but they actually are not the depths of being in itself. They just masquerade as an appearance of the depths of being in itself. And that truly free spirits have confronted the depths of being themselves and, and again, have made their nests out of their own abyss. But um, they realize sort of that the, 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 that the, the depths of being is something that they are connected to and it, it requires their self journey to, to speak from that place, which again, foreshadows how the, the act ends. Uh, there's this idea that in confronting the abyss, one finds monstrous self-riddles about the will to power, the self-overcoming, uh, and that points towards constant self-overcoming. So it's it's this idea that, that really what the will to power is, is not about having power over other people or about becoming a tyrant, but it's about becoming, in some sense, your own master. It's about becoming, you know, about understanding your own body, about understanding your own soul, consequently. Um, and being the type of being that can become empowered in, 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 in a very um, noble way, I think, in a, in a very um, admirable way, in a beautiful way. Um, and that's in the bottom right quadrant, just finishing off here, we have the idea that there's immaculate perception, which is generated by including one's own depths. Uh, bringing one's own debts to the surface and, and and exploring true desires and true wills. And this is juxtaposed against, again, this idea of pure perception, which is like a, a gaze from above, but it's really from outside the system. Um, and that this immaculate perception is something that allows a connection to a childlike within, um, a will and a creativity from a realer space than those who are blocked from the child within, which is, again, the people from uh, the pure perception. And, and I suppose Nietzsche would say the people who are living in a father's or a mother's land, as opposed to a children's land, which is, again, a metaphor that runs throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And finally, the emergence of a will for the future, which is capable of bringing its own joy, capable of enduring imperfection and speaking what is most difficult is ultimately what here the person who has moved through uh, society and has not succumbed to society um, is, um, these are the types of dimensions of being that they're capable of embodying and, and, and enacting and, and moving, moving into the future with. Uh, and that's really what his teaching here is about. That's what his teaching is, is pointing towards. So that gives you sort of a snapshot overview of, of act two. Uh, and again, these are the main concepts we we covered. Everything from dream wisdom, starting off in in the in the alone with a with an image of a child coming to him with a a mirror which shows him the reflection of Satan, um, and ending with a new type of silence, uh, a silence where he is confronted with a feminine voice, which is not a voice, which is trying to get him to speak what he dare not speak. Um, and I think that that sets up act three very nicely. Um, so with that, I'll also just remind you that uh, this is all in preparation for a course, which starts July 15th, which will go into all of the weird cracks and depths of this book in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It will be a collective creative container uh, where we will be oriented and organized towards uh, producing our own work and 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 trying to make sense of Thus Spoke Zarathustra for today. Um, so if you're interested in joining, uh, it might be a great way to spend the summer. It'll run through July, August, and September. Um, visit philosophyportal.online and all the information about the course will be there. All right, so thanks for watching. This has been Act 2, Introducing the Society. Uh, watch out for Acts 3 and 4. I won't give away sort of what I'm deciding to title them, but um, 
So far, we've covered sort of Nietzsche's overview of fundamental concepts related to the overman. And here, I think we get a deeper insight into the way Nietzsche views society. Of course, this is derived from Nietzsche's experience with Christian society, but I think that that still, uh, there's a lot of powerful overlap um, for potentially reflecting on any society um, and consequently for reflecting on our society today. So with that, I will end and I hope you join me again for Acts 3 and 4.